Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. We will continue our discussion on the theory of uh, gains and particularly its application on economic analysis. So, last class if you remember we discussed about different types of game and we will uh, pick up specifically few types of game which is more application uh, which is more applicability in the case of the economic analysis. So, in that context the first uh, discussion will be on the market entry game and here we will analyze that. Uh, how the when the firm uh, plans to enter into the market generally how he uses the game theory and uh, the, from the other point of view the existing firms who those who are there in the market how they use game theory to create a barrier to entry or to if the firm is coming into the market how they are going to maximize the profit. So, game of entry of potential firm in an industry which is already a monopoly firm. So, we will take a case where the existing industry setup is there is only one monopoly firm and there is a potential firm who is enter, trying to enter into the market and compete with the monopolist firm to uh, maximize the profit or get the market share. The incumbent has to decide whether to enter the market or stay out. So, incumbent has two choices or the two options at this point of time. With the whether he has, he has to enter the market or he will stay out, he will not enter into the market. And in the other hand, the existing firm, typically the monopolist firm has also two options, whether to collude, if the firm is entering into the market, whether to collude with the entrant, entrant firm or whether to fight with the entrant firm. So, there are four options that is there with the uh, taking the, the incumbent firm of the existing firm. For the incumbent firm, the options are whether to enter into the market or stay out and to existing firm whether to uh, whether to fight or collude with the new entrant in the market. So, on that basis now we will try to do a payoff matrix for uh, on the basis of the options available to the existing, ex existing firm and also to the incumbent firm. So, to draw this payoff matrix we need the pay off for the all these four options. So, here we will take this the case of the entrant and the two options are either to enter or to stay out. This is for the incumbent and what is the uh, options for them collude or fight. Now, the outcome is in term of market share. So, how we can construct the payoff matrix? Suppose the entrant is deciding to enter and the incumbent firm is collude, once the new entrant comes, the payoff will be 40 and 50. The market share will be 40 for entrant and 50 for the monopolist firm. If the entrant decides to stay out, obviously his outcome is 0, he is not going to any market share and the uh, incumbent firm they are going to get the, they are going to get 100. Then, uh, okay, so let us change, this is the existing monopolist. Now, if the entrant decides to fight and the existing monopolist uh, entrants decide to enter and the existing monopoly decide to fight, in that case if you look at then uh, we uh, uh, take into a case where maybe we can get minus 10 for the payoff and 0 for the monopolist. 
y it is minus 10 and y it is 0, because if the entrant is entering and the existing monopolist is uh, fighting, maybe no one is getting a market share and it goes to uh, goes to someone else, we can do it may be 90. Then if entrant is entering, uh, uh, stay out and obviously, there is no choice this fight. So, this comes again to 0 and 100. Now, the basic purpose of doing a payoff matrix is to evaluate the options when the firm is trying to enter into the market, basically he is evaluating options that if he is entering what will be the market share, what will be the outcome and if he is not entering what will be the market share and what will be the outcome. Similarly, the monopolist has two options. If the entrant is getting into the market, what should be the uh, what should he do, whether he should collude, whether he should fight. So, one payoff will come if the entrant comes into market and if he is going to fight what should be the market share and if the entrant is, uh, is entering to the market if he is going to collude what should be the market share. So, collude fight two options for monopolist, enter into the market stay out uh, from the market two options for the new firm. So, in this case we get four payoff in term of four market share and among them now they will decide that whether it is a dominant strategy, what should be the dominant strategy for both of them, whether they are getting a Nash equilibrium or whether they are getting two Nash equilibrium if there is an absence of the dominant strategy in both these cases. Now, in this case what should be the strategy of the rational monopolist, because we assume that the monopolist has to rational and what should be the strategy of the rational monopolist and where the Nash equilibrium generally occurs. So, Nash equilibrium occurs when entrants enter and the incumbent firm collude with it. So, in this case if you remember your payoff matrix that is the case where both of them they are getting a market share. In all these three options either them is either of them is getting a 0 or them getting a minus, but uh, in this case when both if the a uh, new firm is entering into the market and existing firm colluding with it, then that is whatever the market share is getting that is more for preferable for both from the monopolist point of view and the new firm point of view if they are acting rational. So, when it comes to the Nash equilibrium, Nash equilibrium typically occurs when the entrants enter and the incumbent firm collude with it, because this is the point actually where both of them they are getting some amount of the market share. Okay. So, before uh, going uh, to this, this is what this is which uh, this is also a types of uh, game and we will see what is the game tree over here, because this is also a sequential game and in this case sequential game how I uh, will see how the game tree looks like. So, this is for the entrant, it has two options, one is enter, another is stay out. If it is enter, enter then the existing uh, monopolist has two options, one is collude, another is fight. So, in that case we get uh, two columns of our monopoly, both for the entrant and for the monopoly. So, in this case we get 40, 50. So, if entrant enter monopolist collude with it, we get a market share, we get a payoff matrix 40, 50, where the share of entrant is 40, where the share of the monopolist is 50. If entrant enter monopolist fight, then we get a share of minus 10 for entrant, because cannot uh, part it, uh, cannot compete with the monopolist and 0 for the monopolist, because the market share is not going to come to you, it is fighting with the existing market. Or same thing can be analyzed in a different version also, because it is getting a market share of 90, whereas the other entrant is getting a market share of 10. Then stay out, then what is the option for the monopolist? It is again collude, it is again fight again we will get a, a payoff matrix for both the entrant and the monopolist 
and here we get the pay of h 0 0 100 and 0 100 because if the entrant is staying out obviously the market share is 0 whether and the second part is not at all relevant because if it is staying out the question is not coming whether monopoly should collude or monopoly should fight. So, basically and the market share of entrant will be 0 and whether and the all these cases of market share of the monopolist will be 100. So, this is the case of a sequential game where uh, the decision of one firm is always dependent on what is the uh, decision of the other firms. And in this case uh, uh, the decision is followed from whatever the market share, what is the end outcome here? The end outcome is to maximize the market share dependent on what is the outcome with respect to its decision points and also looking at to that what is the rival's action. Like if the entrant is trying to get into the market, now what should be the, uh, what should be the decision point of the monopolist? So, the entrant will evaluate option in terms of two things that whether the monopolist is going to collude or whether the monopolist is going to fight. Similarly, the monopolist is going to take the options that what would be the market share if he is going to fight and if he is going to collude on that basis he will decide what is the dominant strategy for him. So, typically in case of a market entry situation, in case of a situation where the market is trying to enter into the market where there is a monopolist firm generally this game theory is relevant, typically a sequential game theory where it gives us the sequence that what should happen if, uh, if one firm behaves in this direction and then the other firms behave in the following action. Then we will talk about the application of uh, game theory in case of a Carnot model. So, if you remember we discussed this Carnot model in case of a non-collusive oligopoly and Carnot model talks about a situation that uh, where there are two firms they are sharing the market and they always assume that the uh, whatever the previous output plan for the other firm that has to be followed in the revised period also, but practically it, it leads to a situation where they reach to a suboptimal solution or we can say top, uh, part of the market is still untapped by both of the duopolist firm because they always assume that the, the output plan whatever followed by the firm in the previous time period that has to that is going to be continued. So, the same thing we will see that how this uh, game theory is applied to a Carnot model. If both the firms they fight with each other then they earn the duopoly profit because they share the market and they earn a duopoly profit. But if they form a cartel each firm earns a greater profit, but given the structure of the game and the players rivalry, they end up in a suboptimal equilibrium. So, Connaught model if you look at always they feel that okay, the other one is going to share, take the half of the market. So, his decision point is on the basis of that the other firm is going to take half. So, let me take another half and in that process when the iteration takes place, finally in the revised period, revised period and then the nth period if you look at the one third is only taken care of and rest if you look at rest of the uh, rest uh, rest of the market is not taken care of neither of this firm. But the other option is that if they form a cartel, if they cooperate with each other then then ideally they can decide on the basis of their productive capacity or on the basis of their cost function they can decide that who has to share how much of the market or who has to supply how much share of the market and on that basis they can tap the full market and they can reach to into a optimal equilibrium. But practically the structure of the game is such the Connaught model is such that there is a rivalry and they always believe that the output plan is not going to revise by the play other player and that is why they go, go on consider the same output plan and they accordingly they devise their our price and output plan and that is why they lead to a suboptimal equilibrium rather than optimal equilibrium. So, here how we can conclude, we can conclude that even if the cooperation is uh, profitable still the firms they are not cooperating with each other rather they are competing with each other and going into a suboptimal equilibrium rather than a optimal equilibrium. Then we will see the Stackelberg model. So, if you remember in case of Stackelberg model, it is a leader follower model. Generally one follow, generally one take a uh, lead and the other one is follow. 
So, we will see that generally the sequential kind sequence, sequential types of game is used in case of the stackle work model. So, sequential move game is different from the Cournot game and typically in case of uh, there is also a difference in case of a Cournot model and Stackelberg model. Even if Stackelberg model is the extension of the Cournot model, uh, in case of Stackelberg model the significant feature is that one firm acts as the leader and the other firms act as the follower. So, sequential move game is that is how it is different from the Cournot game. Here one firm known as the leader chooses his output second form chooses after observing the first quantity of the output. So, one is as the leader form, second one is the follower form. One form generally chooses okay, this is the output I am going to produce and the second form after looking at or after observing that what is the output plan for the first form, generally the second form decide his quantity. So, this is generally known as a follower leader game and uh, here the leader firm always sets a higher quantity of output and earns more profit than the follower firms and by doing or this they get because they have the first mover advantage. Since they are the leader, they are the first one to decide what should be the output. Generally they get a greater advantage in terms of the share in market share in terms of the profit because they are the first one to decide what is the share of them and this is generally known as the first mover advantage and always in case of a stackle work model the leader leader firm get a first mover advantage because they are the first one to choose the output and in that way they can maximize the market share and they can maximize the profit also. So, in case of stackle work model the equilibrium is decided on the basis of the backward induction in the game theory and uh, how we say this the backward induction in the game theory because this technique first consider the optimal strategy of the player and its best response which takes the move that are last in the game. So, the equilibrium whatever the method is follow generally known as the backward induction in the game theory. So, in the previous case also in the market entry if you look at the decision of decision point is based on that what is the last decision point of the rivals or what is the last decision point of the opponent. So, this is the part of the backward induction in the game theory where the decision is dependent on the what is the previous decision taken by the opponent and this technique first consider the optimal strategy of the player and its best response which, which it takes the move and that is the previous or previous time period that is the last in the game. Here predicting the future action of the last player, the second last player proceeds taking the best move. So, in the when it is coming to take uh, but about the last player or the uh, predicting about the future action, here the second last player proceeds taking the best move and the process continues backward in time determining for each player the best response until the beginning of the game is reached. So, when we identify the best of best uh, what is the best option for each player, they go in a backward direction till the time they are reaching the uh, the uh, uh, reaching the beginning of the game because that way they just go on evaluating what is the best response uh, with respect to the previous time period or with respect to the uh, action taken in the previous time period and in that way they decide the optimal strategy. So, in the game theory typically to conclude the game theory we can say in the game theory we discuss about the structure of the game, we discuss about what are the assumptions to be taken to use the game theory and then we talked about the types of game and how this game is being used in the case of the economic analysis. So, so to sum up we can say that game theory is a tool which is used typically in the economic analysis to understand the group dynamics, to understand the group behavior specifically in case of a oligopoly market structure. Then we will start a new topic that is on product pricing because till now we have the understanding that price is de decided on the basis of the demand and supply, but there are uh, this is the main basis of demand and supply, but there are many other consideration is taken when we decide the price of the product. So, our next topic will be on product pricing and before deciding the product pricing, we will also talk about the kind of price discrimination and then we will go what is the type of product pricing and what is the basis of the product pricing. So, 
what is the meaning of price? If you look at this is the market price, this is the value of the product, but what price for the seller, what price for the buyer? So, if you go in depth, it is the price is basically the revenue to the seller, because in the end it leads to the revenue to them and for the buyer, it is the perceived value of goods and services to them. So, the question here is that what is the right price for a product? So, since price leads different uh, meaning to different kind of different economic agent like its revenue to the seller and perceived value to the buyers. Now, what is the right price of the product? Right price of the product is one where all economic ag agent maximize their objectives. Now, who are the economic agents here? The buyers, price is one where he maximize his utility or may, may be maximize his consumption. For seller, when it is maximizing the sales revenue, for the supplier, it is the maximization of the output and for a firm, it is the maximization of the profit, because price to him is to maximize the profit, to the seller maximizing the sales revenue, to the producer maximize the uh, output and to the buyer, it is maximize the utility. So, the right price is one which maximize the end objective of all the economic agent in the market or all the economic agent associated with the product. Now, when the firm they need to decide about the price of its product, when it is not only when there is selling it, they are selling a new product, also they need to decide when they are selling the modified or the improved product or when the seller is entering into the new market or the new market in a typical market segment. So, maybe the price has to be decided when the seller is selling a new product or seller is doing some modification or a improvement to the initial product or when the seller is entering to the new market or they are entering into the different segment of the existing market. In all these cases, there is a value addition to the product, whether it is a new product whether it is a uh, improvement in the existing product or whether the product is entering into the new segment. Since, in all these three scenario, there is a value addition to the product. In all these three cases, the producer need to think or the seller needs to think what should be the right price for the product, which will give some amount of the uh, some amount of the uh, profit, some amount of the benefit to all the economic agent in, in the uh, line of their end objectives. So, what is the basic determinant of price? We know there are uh, the main determinant of price is demand and supply, but apart from it, it always linked the price is always linked what is the objective of the firm. If the objective of the firm is to market increase the market share, then they are not going to charge a high price, they are going to charge a low price whether so that they can tap the market. If the objective of the firm is to maximize the profit, they will see at that scenario whether the high price or the low price, which one will suit more for the profit maximization. What is the cost of production? Whether it is a high cost production, whether it is a low cost production. If it is high cost production, then the price has to be high. If it is low cost production, the price has to be low because in uh, high cost production, if it is low price, it is not going to uh, it is not going to maximize the profit by charging that level of price. What should be the what is the market structure? If the market structure, then the entirely the price is decided by the demand and supply, but if the uh, perfect competitive market structure, if it is monopoly, then the monopolist decide because he is the price taker firm in the market. If it is monopolistic again or the oligopolist again it depends what is the market power or what is the power of them to set the price on that basis the price will set. What should be the competitor strategy? If the price is going to increase or if the price is going to decrease, how the rivals or how the opposite opposite or the how the opponent is going to react over here that decides what should be the right kind of price then elasticity of demand, more elastic is the market, there is less flexibility in term of change in the price. 
more less elastic at least you can change the price because the quantity demanded is not going to change simultaneously in that proportion because it is a case of the inelastic demand. Similarly, government policy whether it is a regulated market whether it is a unregulated market. In case of regulated market any increase in the price or whenever the price is being set by the firm they have to take the consent from the government. But in case of unregulated market at least it is decided by the agents whoever or all the firms those who are operating in the market what should be the price. So, in that context we will discuss about two kind of pricing one is multi product pricing and second is about the price discrimination, discrimination on the basis of the different grounds. We will discuss about two kind of pricing and then we will move into the different types of product pricing. So, we will start with multi product pricing and where multi product pricing is relevant, multi product pricing is relevant because most modern firms they produce variety of product rather than single product. And if you look at you talk the you take the case of your PNG Procter and Gamble or you take the case of your Hindustan liver, their product is not single, they rather they produce a multi product. And in this case if it is a multi product, how the pricing has to be done and why the challenge is there for the pricing? Because demand for the various products are separable, but cost are not quite divisible product wise. Like for the in the one assembly line, if the intermediate, intermediate good is one product and the final good is one product, obviously it is difficult to make a division that what is the product, what is the cost associated with the intermediate product and what is the cost associated with the final product. And that is why in case of a multi product pricing, the demand is separable but the cost is not separable. So, the cost has to be or where the price has to be decided on the basis of the combined cost for both the product. So, in this case we get a separated demand function and there is only one cost function. So, profit maximizing price will be given by a point at which the combined marginal revenue for the products equals to the marginal cost or we can say that the marginal revenue of each of this product equal to the combined marginal cost. So, we will just take a uh, graphical explanation to understand this uh, identification or the deriving the profit maximizing price and output in case of a multi product pricing. So, we have uh, if it is two product then we have two demand function and corresponding marginal revenue function then we have P 2 M R 2 this is the marginal cost. Then we will get a combined marginal revenue curve that is M R 1 and M R 2 this is C M R and on that basis we will we'll look at the price and suppose this price is E 2 on this basis or this is the point E 2 on this basis both the firms they are going to charge the price. So, this is for P 2 that is Q 2 this is P 2 and similarly for M R 1 this is price and this is the quantity. So, in case of uh, if you look at individually you can do it by making it with M R 1 with M C and correspondingly we can get price 1 or M R 2 is equal to M C and correspondingly we can get price 2. But since this is the case of a multi product pricing we have this combined marginal function and on that basis we are getting two price that is uh, the we are getting the point E 2 on that basis the price is decided that is P 2 for the firm 2 and producing the output P 2 is for the product 2 and producing Q 2 level of output and P 1 is for product 1 producing Q 1 level of output. Then the second we will say uh, the price discrimination and price discrimination if you look at this is a significant feature of the monopolist firm. And why we call it discrimination? We call it discrimination 
because the monopolist charges different prices to the different consumer in a different market in different time period uh, exercising their discretion power and that is why this is known as the price discrimination by the monopolist. Now, to put it in a definition what is price discrimination? It is the act of charging different prices to different consumer in order to capture the consumer surplus. So, the motivation is to capture the consumer surplus and they do this, they capture this consumer surplus by charging different prices to the different consumer. Now, what is the basis or what is the prerequisite for this price discrimination in which case monopolist can practice a price discrimination? The firm must have the market power and some control over the price that is present in the monopolist market and that is why they practice the monopoly, they practice the price discrimination. The firm must be able to distinguish between consumers market on the basis of the elasticity of demand. So, there should be division between the consumer, there should be division between the market on the basis of the elasticity of demand. The firm must be able to prevent re resale, market must be separable. It is not that you can buy in the market, in, you can buy in one market at a lower price and sell it in the other market. So, resale to be control, otherwise it is not going to be profitable or they cannot practice the price discrimination. So, this price discrimination can be possible owing to consumer peculiarity and how this consumer peculiarity come here. Suppose in any situation, if consumer A is unaware of the fact that he is paying a higher price as compared to B or sometimes the price discrimination is so small, it is so, it's negligible and that is why. Uh, the uh, monopoly generally do a price discrimination because consumer is just uh, uh, indifferent about the small change in the price, uh, a small change in the price between two market or two consumer. In the first case, when consumer A is the unaware of the fact that consumer P is paying a lower price. So, on that basis, uh, we can uh, discuss about uh, three type of price discrimination that is first degree, second degree and third degree. So, when we talk about the consumer peculiarity that is uh, more significant uh, in case of maybe third degree uh, and that is why this consumer peculiarity comes up under the part of the third degree price discrimination. But here one more consumer peculiarity comes here is when one consumer typically if you remember your Vavlin effect in case of uh, uh, consumer behavior. When price increases, people they think that the product imp uh, quality has improved and that is why they pay it. In this case also, how this price discrimination is possible? When the uh, even if the consumer knows that he is paying a higher price, but if he feels that he is getting a product which is a higher quality of the other products, still the price discrimination is possible. So, price discrimination is possible when the consumer is not aware of the fact that the other one is paying a lower price or consumer feels that if he is paying a higher price, there is a quality attached to it. And in the third case, the, the price difference is so minute, it is so negligible that generally consumer ignore this. Similarly, the discrimination also owing to, owing to the nature of the group and sometimes the discrimination also owing to the distance and the front barrier. So, these are the uh, prerequisite for the different type of price discrimination. And as we discussed, there are three types of price discrimination, first degree price discrimination, second degree price discrimination and third degree price discrimination. We will start with the discussion with the first degree price discrimination. So, in the first degree price discrimination, the monopolist charges each consumer their maximum willingness to pay whatever they are willing to pay, it is the, the monopoly generally charges the price which comes under the maximum. And generally in the first degree, price discrimination eliminates consumer surplus because each consumer pays the maximum amount whatever they are willing to pay. And also, it uh, charges the maximum possible price for each unit of output. 
So, first degree price discrimination generally eliminates the dead weight loss, because monopolists are able to provide goods more to the consumer. So, we will just take the uh, graphical examples to understand uh, what is the, how the generally monopolist by practicing the first degree price discrimination take out all the consumer surplus and also even there is no dead weight loss, because uh, dead weight loss comes when the price increases and quantity decreases, but here at that price the producer is ready to supply whatever the goods come and that is why there is no dead weight loss, the entire consumer surplus goes into the account of the producer surplus. So, if we consider this as equal to m c is equal to a c, this is our demand function. Okay. So, how we get the consumer surplus? This is the market price. If for this one, for q 1, if the consumer is ready to pay this much, the monopolist will charge a price p 1, because this is the maximum willingness of the consumer to pay for the amount q 1. Similarly, if for q 2, if the consumer is ready to pay p 2, the monopolist will charge a price p 2. Similarly, for this uh, amount q 3, if the monopoly, if the consumer is ready to p 3 or the willingness to pay is p 3, generally this is the market price. So, in this case, ideally when the consumer is ready to p 1, but the market price is p 1. Uh, p, this is the amount of consumer surplus it gets. If for q 2, if the consumer is ready to p 2, but generally he get pay only p, which is the market price, this is the amount of the consumer surplus and similarly for p 3. But in this case, since the monopolist is charging on the basis of willingness to pay, the entire consumer surplus is goes to the account of monopolist and there is no consumer surplus for the there is no consumer surplus for the uh, typically the consumers those who are buying this product. Next we will see, so in one case we know that the consumer there is the entire consumer surplus is taken by the monopolist and secondly we will see how there is no dead weight loss, because the entire dead weight loss is also goes with the consumer surplus. So, in this case we will take this is marginal cost is equal to supply and here we get the demand curve, here we get the marginal revenue curve. On the basis of the marginal revenue and marginal cost, this is the price to be followed and this is the monopoly price. On the basis of the demand and supply, we can say this is the competitive price, here this is the competitive output, this is the monopoly output. Now, what is the, here we will say this area is A, this area is B, this area is D, this area is C and this area is E. Now, here if you look at what is the consumer surplus with the monopoly, if in a normal market, if the monopolist is not practicing uh, the mono, monopolist is not practicing price discrimination, what is the consumer surplus with the monopoly? That is the uh, area A, this is the consumer surplus, because the monopolist is not charging the price discrimination. But if and what is the producer surplus here? We are assuming the fact that there is no discrimination at this point of time, the monopolist is not doing the price discrimination. If monopolist is not doing the price discrimination, this is the total consumer surplus. And what is the producer surplus? Producer surplus is the area B plus D, this is the total producer surplus. Now, consumer surplus is A, producer surplus is B plus D. What is the dead weight loss? Because if both consumer surplus is producer surplus is there, this is not the competitive price, this is the monopolist price, there is some amount of the dead weight loss. And what is the dead weight loss? 
deadweight loss is C plus A. All these consumer surplus, producer surplus, deadweight loss, assuming the fact that this is a monopoly market structure where the price discrimination is not being practiced. Now, if the first degree price discrimination is going to uh, practice, if the first degree price discrimination is going to practice, now we will see whether there is consumer surplus at all, if entire and second is whether there is a deadweight loss or not. So, looking at this now, if we say if there is a discrimination now, now what is the discrimination? Discrimination is first degree. If the discrimination is first degree, we will see what is consumer surplus, what is producer surplus, and what is deadweight loss. So, consumer surplus with first degree it has to be 0, because the monopoly will charge a price on the basis of the willingness to pay that is 0. And what is the producer surplus? Producer sur deadweight loss is also 0, because the entire amount suppose there is this price is this much, if they are going on uh, go, going on charge the price which is the maximum willingness to pay and this is the P C on that basis Q C is come. Now, this is the deadweight loss if the quantity demanded decreases because of increase in the price, but since monopoly has the capacity to produce the supply whatever may be the price, this C plus C what is deadweight loss this also goes into the account of the producer surplus and that is why we get the producer surplus which is A plus B plus C plus D plus E, there is no deadweight loss and there is no consumer surplus. So, in case of first degree price discrimination, the monopolies charge a price on the basis of the maximum willingness to pay for the uh, maximum willingness to pay of the consumer and in that case they capture entire consumer surplus and even there is no deadweight loss, because the entire surplus goes into the producer surplus. So, this is the highest kind of degree of price discrimination, but if you look at also in the practice it is difficult to follow, because you need to know what is the willingness of the consumer of the different group in the different market. Then we will talk about the second degree price discrimination and what is the focus of the second degree price discrimination or what is the practice being followed in case of the second degree price discrimination. Here instead of setting the different prices for each unit, pricing is done on the basis of the quantities of output purchased by the individual consumer. So, here the discrimination is on not on the basis of the price, rather it is on the basis of the quantity. And typical example of the second degree price discrimination is meter services like electricity and telephone, because if you know uh, the first few calls typical in a landline if you look at the first few calls or even for the mobile services also you will find may be 200 minutes is free or 20 calls are free or uh, at least 10 SMS are free that comes with the plan. And if you go beyond then, then you charge a different, you get a, you have to pay different price. Similarly, in case of electricity also for 0 to 200 unit there is one tariff rate. 200 unit to 500 unit there is one more tariff rate, 500 unit to 700 unit there is one more tariff rate. So, the, if you look at the charges are different on the di, charges are different on the basis of the different in the difference in the usage. So, if it is the usage is between this unit to this unit, this has to be the price. So, here the discrimination is not on the basis of the price, rather the discrimination on the basis of usage or the discrimination on the basis of the quantity. So, we will take the graphical uh, explanation to the second degree price discrimination. Okay. So, suppose we take this as q 1, we take this as Q t. So, here we get a price that is P 1, then we get a price P 2, then we get a price P 3. Okay. 
So, for here if you look at for q 1 from 0 to q 1 the price being followed is p 1. From q 1 to q 2 the price being followed is p 2 and beyond this q 2 any level of output beyond this beyond q 2 we followed a price that is p 3. So, here it is not on the basis of p 1 we are identifying q 1 or p 2 we are identifying q 2 rather on the basis of up to 0 to q 1 amount of output price has to be p 1, q 1 to q 2 price has to be p 2 and q 2 beyond q 2 price has to be p 3. So, the price discrimination here is on the basis of the uh, here is on the basis of the quantity rather than the price. Then we will talk about the third degree price discrimination which is more common and commonly practiced in the market structure and it separates the market on the basis of the price elasticity of demand. And here the segmentation is based on geographic separation of markets, nature of use and personal characteristic of the consumer. So, one the market is uh, market is divided on the basis of the elasticity of demand like less elastic market, more elastic market and on that basis price is generally being followed and say, secondly the uh, segmentation is on the basis of the sometimes the geographic separation like if you look at the uh, typically books, it is Indian edition, foreign edition, international edition what is the nature of use on the basis of the personal characteristic of also consumer. So, on that basis uh, if you look at the we will get two kind of market and in the two kind of market the monopolist will charge a different price and how they will charge different prices because in the elastic market any small change in the price will lead to a greater change in the quantity demanded. So, they will always charge a lower price to get more quantity change in the quantity demanded in the elastic market and there the profit maximization or policy is to less price more quantity demanded. And in case of the inelastic market they will charge a higher price because the consumer they are less responsible responsive to change in the price. So, even if the monopolist is charging a higher price still there is no decrease much decrease in the quantity demanded. So, they will always charge a higher price in case of the uh, inelastic demand and lower price in case of a elastic demand to make this price disc discrimination which more effective or make more profitable. So, we will uh, check this how this uh, third degree price discrimination can be followed. Okay. So, here this is market 1. So, D 1 marginal revenue 1. this is market 2 and this is the total market. Now, here it is the inelastic market we can uh, check this from the shape of the uh, demand curve taking together we get a demand curve and also get a marginal revenue curve. So, this is demand curve for t this is marginal revenue of curve for t that is the total and here this we get the as the on the basis of the marginal cost we get this is the total output of the uh, total sale or the total output of the market. Now, how this has to be get divided between both the market. So, correspondingly we will take the marginal cost from here taking the marginal revenue and marginal cost the price is decided in the second market that is P 2 and taking the same cost function will decide the price in case of the first market that is P 1. So, by following this P 1 in the market 1 Q 1 has to be produced and here Q t has to be produced or to be sold. So, Q 1 has to be sold in market 1, Q 2 has to be sold in the market 2. The price of 1 is higher than price of 2, 
because this is the case of the inelastic market and this is the case of the elastic market. So, in case of the third degree price discrimination, the monopolist charge different prices on the different market and markets are segmented on the basis of the elasticity of demand. So, if it is more elastic generally the firm charges a lower price and if it is high elastic then the firm charges a higher price. Then we will take a numerical to understand this price discrimination, how this prices are being uh, discriminated on the basis of the uh, uh, price are discriminated on the basis of the uh, third degree price discrimination when market is uh, differentiated or on the basis of the elasticity of demand. Now, what the monopolists they get out of this third degree price discrimination? In the first case, they are capturing the consumer surplus in case of the first degree price discrimination. In the second case, it is the meter service. So, on the basis of the usage, they are trying, trying to charge a higher price and on that basis they are getting the profit. In case of third degree, then generally they are segregated on the basis of the elasticity of demand and they know that the when the market is elastic, they can charge a lower price because the consumer they are more sensitive in the elastic market and that is why if you are charging a higher price, there will be significant reduction in the quantity demanded. That is why they charge a lower price in case of a elastic market and they charge a higher price in the inelastic market because if they are charging a higher price, still there is no much difference in the quantity demanded or no much decrease in the quantity demanded and by that they can maximize the profit. So, we will continue our discussion on price discrimination, uh, the typically the third degree price discrimination and international price discrimination in the next session and along with that also we will talk about the different types of uh, pricing, how what is the basis of pricing and what are the different type of pricing, product pricing in the next session.